Are we on the brink of a revolution? The biggest question we could possibly ask right now. Where is this going? And I like to point out to people that I've been right a lot lately. And I, I mean, it's, I don't, I really don't want to gloat because it's a terrible time to be right about stuff. I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. Like, yeah, this is kind of where things are going right now. And we find ourselves in the midst of an unprecedented two crises in a row in America today that are both truly global crises that are very exciting to the collapsitarian in all of us. But there's a bigger question that we have to ask. And I'm, I'm really confident in my understanding of where things are right now and the current momentum of the situation. A lot of people are coming to me and asking, so Adam, where is this going? You have to doubt, you have, you have to tell us, you have, you have to, you see the whiteboard in my hand now? Yes, you, we're going to do some explaining today. You, you have to tell us where this is going. Well, I don't know. And, but I, what I know is that it's impossible to predict anybody who tells you we're going to have an election in November or we're not going to have an election in November is either one of the assholes pulling the strings that we got to worry about or they're full of shit because we don't, we don't know where this is going right now. And it's tempting to think, well, may, maybe, maybe this is just a blip, right? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe there's, there's, there's the Corona crisis and then there's the George Floyd, Floyd, George Floyd crisis and, and things go back to normal. Can you tell I was an art major? It could be that this is one crisis after another, after another, after another, and it just keeps ratcheting up. And that's that's the concern. You know, where this is the first the first question we have to ask ourselves: Is this now a trend of instability? Is this the new normal, or are we going to go back to normal? Or option three is that upward trend of crisis and upheaval engineered. And is it going to keep being engineered that way until we get to a certain point of submission or a further concentration of wealth and power? So we're going to cover a, a, a lot of news stories today to bring this together and give you a, 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 an answer to this question. Are we on the brink? Of revolution, and I'm I'm happy to say that I've got this from the Washington Post of all places via thehour.com by Christine Adams. This is a very mainstream question. Suddenly, are we on the brink of revolution? So she talks about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the pattern of long-term structural problems, meaning sudden crises that historically have shaped revolutions in the past. Now, it's worth pointing out, and, and we're going to come back to this uh, story in, in, in a much more depth, but it's important to point out that the current eruption, the timing of it now, is the product of the mainstream media. And you, oh, but Adam, what about the, the George Floyd video that went viral? There are videos that go just as viral on a regular basis that did not lead to revolutions like this. And someone challenged me on this yesterday. He was like, but Adam, we didn't, we didn't see it in such stark, offensive contrast. A, a, a white cop on the knee of, uh, with his knee on the neck of a black man in broad daylight on American streets. Actually, we did. Eric Garner, loose cigarettes. It wasn't a knee, it was a chokehold. It was more offensive as a video. And by the way, skipping ahead to dailystar.co.uk, George Floyd had coronavirus and died after cardiac arrest, police report claimed. <laughs> oh, oh we'll, we'll put this in the category with the Washington Post story that we covered two weeks ago where they said that a shooting victim because he had tested positive corona for coronavirus was check coronavirus death. Okay, yeah. It will never cease to be funny to talk about the, the, the skydiver whose parachute didn't open 
and died of coronavirus right before he hit the ground. And so he got counted in the statistics too. This is now on the record. They're trying, they, and, and you go, oh, really? We're definitely not afraid of this shit now. Hennepin County has released the George Floyd autopsy report, which confirms he died from a heart attack, which was only complicated by law enforcement subdual. No, Corona rules the day in terms of causes of death. You can scroll down, CJ. We don't, I don't mind sharing this guy's image one more time. Minneapolis cop Derek Chauvin charged now with second degree murder. Pushed out from behind the thin blue line. Red Rover, Red Rover, send Floyd's killer right over, as we heard at the police lines in Phoenix due to Jim Freedom's reporting. Mm. This is just the insanity of what we're facing today. All right, back to uh, back to Christine Adams. Are we on the brink of revolution? As we grapple with what might change in the wake of COVID-19, and unrest across the country. The case of the French Revolution of 1789 reminds us of the contested nature of social change. Revolutions do not necessarily erupt at the moment when people are most oppressed. Rather, revolutions have more often been the result of rising expectations. Periods of progress followed by crush hopes can be especially dangerous, leading to rage and violence. All right, back to the whiteboard, CJ, please. So if we look at just you know the course of human history on the x-axis and on the y-axis human productivity and we see that over time this is kind of an exponential curve and we're, we're zooming way in here so this this is you know it could be the last hundred years doesn't really matter what part of history you're looking at but how much has government grown over the last hundred years how much has government come to skim off the top of humanity's productivity you know it's it's always been this line and 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 that is growing exponentially now right and here's the thing it's this time it's the space in between our potential that is being robbed from us by government increasingly stark here in the red area in between where we get to experience what it's like to be an american quality of life standard of living, all of these things, compared to where it could be, what, two or three times that? What would that mean? What does that mean when, when, the, when the people of the world get a sense of that space in, in, in the red here, the, the, this what has been stolen from us? That's what's going to lead to the revolution, and it's, it's happening now. And this is a big part of the, the George Floyd riots that, that I don't think is fully appreciated. When you're in a forced unemployment crisis, if you're, if you're homeless or you're struggling to feed your kids because of the, the government's corona crisis, it's a, it, that's what it is. It's a government crisis. It's a forced unemployment crisis. It's not a health crisis. The, the pandemic is a real minor health threat that we could deal with rationally without government. But this... And you say, now, 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 now we're going to kill you, too. And now we're going to put it in your face. And I, I don't want to play this game of, you know, white versus black. Yeah, and it, it's crazy to see this conversation unfolding all over Twitter today. Well, what about all the white people who are killed by police officers? Yeah, yeah, that's a problem, too. Well, white people should be just as upset as black people. But there's, in, in a way, yes, it's the media that has whipped up black America into this frenzy now over this and i don't like i'm not saying like hey be, give them an excuse take it you know go for it jump in the streets make shit happen express your anger you know i'm i i support you doing that although i think there are better love-based peaceful means of bringing about real social change so why why not steal from target right the store that's a lot your restaurant is shut down you lose your job as a server as a bartender whatever it is that you were doing to get by targets allowed to stay open. <laughs> yeah. Why not? And I hope that there's a deeper realization of this, of how, because what would that look like? Again, what, if, if, for the average to have your 
quality of life doubled. I mean, just, and that's, that's really being very, very conservative in this estimate here of how much our quality of life is being robbed from us by a system set up for the rich to get richer while the poor get poor. Well, but right now the average working American is working for government half the year. You add up all the costs of government and taxes, fees, fines, all the other hidden costs. You go, holy crap, I'm working for government half the dang year. Like really? Your quality of life could double. I mean, maybe you'd be spending some of the money on the legitimate government services. We'd be creating a better social safety net. But take away the red tape and all the restrictions on productivity. All of our potential being robbed from us. That's the awareness that needs to come about for this to really happen. Alexis, Alexis de Tocqueville was one of the first political theorists to highlight what he viewed as a curious paradox. The French Revolution erupted not when the nation was in the throes of decline, such as during the War of the Spanish Succession in the later years of the reign of Louis XIV, but rather at a time of relative prosperity in France. In his words, a study of comparative statistics makes it clear that in none of the decades immediately following the revolution did our national prosperity make such rapid forward strides as in the two preceding it. In fact, those parts of France that had experienced the greatest improvements are the most pronounced popular discontent in the late 1780s, and these became centers of revolutionary activity. De Tocqueville attributed this to King Louis XVI's relatively light hand over the country and his desire to lessen the weight of absolutist rule. Quote, for it is not always when things are going from bad to worse that revolutions break out. On the contrary, it often happens when a people which is put up with an oppressive rule over a long period without protest suddenly finds the government relaxing its pressure. It takes up arms against it. That might be one analysis of this phenomenon, one important dynamic. But there's another way of looking at it, which is that protest is a luxury good. When you're struggling to feed yourself and your family, you're not organizing protests and rallies and demonstrations. These are things that come when you have the prosperity for gas money, when you have the luxury of time to say, I'm going to change the system. And here's the thing, as we get to that big uptick in the curve of human productivity, when nobody really starves anymore, you know, like this is just a beautiful thing to point out. Like, look at how far we've come in America today. There are countries where, because of the coronaphobia crisis, people are are struggling in a way that Americans don't know anymore. We have enough food to feed everybody. Food banks and pantries are doing very well in this crisis. But really, it's a good, it's an amazing thing to celebrate. Well, guess what? Now, when it's a forced unemployment crisis and everybody can eat. There's a lot of time for protesting. There's a lot of time for revolution. Now, I don't want it to come through protest. I don't think it can. However, historians have identified other factors. Yes, the lives of many French people were improving in the second half of the 18th century as epidemic disease and food shortages became less common, allowing for a decline in mortality. Overseas and domestic trade increased over the course of the century, making consumer goods such as sugar and coffee more widely available. The slave trade and the labor of enslaved people on plantations in France's Caribbean colonies fueled the availability of these goods as well as French prosperity more generally. And Louis XVI, influenced by Enlightenment philosophy that called upon kings to rule in the interests of their subjects, did take into consideration the well-being of the French people. But things were not, in fact, going well in France in the years immediately preceding the revolution in 1789. The economy was in a downward spin. The Eden Treaty of 1786 negotiated to open trade between France and Great Britain, Britain created terrible pressure on French industry and many thousands of textile workers lost their jobs. The year 1788 was a terrible one for agriculture and led to food shortages throughout the country, pushing many to leave home in search of employment. These roving bands of men triggered fear among the broader population already living close to the edge. I think you can see the parallel that Christine is drawing here. 
And there's a, a few indicators of, you know, the parallels here with the riots that we're experiencing today and this engineered chaos makes me wonder are we going to have an election in november is we've got we're we're, we're at two in a row like I, I can't predict at this point if we see a third in a row there'll be a much more clear pattern this could be the one-two punch of the left against trump who's also the uh it, i should that's not really fair or accurate it's really it, it, the one two punch of the democrat side of the left against the republican side of the left so skipping ahead to fox5ny.com police and soldiers return fire killing man in louisville yeah it's that real now in Louisville, Kentucky, police officers and National Guard soldiers enforcing a curfew killed a man early Monday when they returned fire after someone in a large group fired at them first, the city's police chief said. A shocked, a shocked witness said the group had nothing to do with the protests, adding he never thought I would experience that here in America. Someone fired a shot at them and both soldiers and officers returned fire. The chief said it was unclear if the person killed is the one who fired at the law enforcers. Several persons of interest were being interviewed. Now, why step aside from the bigger narrative to this one story? This happened deliberately. The people who set up this situation, who put those men with guns in the streets, knew that this would happen eventually. You don't have to be conspiratorial and think, oh, maybe it was an infiltrator in the crowd. Maybe it was a cop sneaking in who shot at them from, you know, why not? Why not? The government's done creepier, more evil, suspicious, du duplicitous things than that. Why not? Why not have a cop or or hire an Antifa person, whatever, to infiltrate or go, you know, and fire a shot over the heads of the cops and soldiers? With a crowd in between. Well, now you have an excuse for the cops and soldiers to shoot into the crowd. Yeah. Now, if you didn't think that was enough to piss people off, we go to yahoo.com for a story from Ross McGinnis. Coronavirus. Sex during lockdown with someone outside your household is illegal from today. Wow. Now, this is from the UK. This is not the United States yet. Although I, I never cease to get a giggle every time I mention <laughs> that the New York City Health Department had to specifically put out a directive saying that, yes, stay six feet apart and avoid oral anal sex because it's spreading the virus standing six feet apart maintaining social distancing includes not licking each other's buttholes okay new yorkers just like yeah but now there's sex so having sex in your own home with someone from a different household is illegal from today after the government altered its coronavirus legislation at 11 30 a.m on monday a change to the law was introduced that bans two people from different households in england gathering in an indoor private place during the coronavirus lockdown. The amendment to the health protection coronavirus restrictions bill states no person may participate in a gathering which takes place in a public or private place indoors and consists of two or more persons. Previously, going to another person's home to have sex would have been a breach of coronavirus lockdown restrictions, but now both parties could be prosecuted under the law. Having sex in public <laughs> is already illegal. <clears throat> only those with a reasonable excuse are permitted to meet in a private place. Now, this goes one of two ways. Either, oh, you took away sex. <laughs> That's how revolutions get started. Or we have to make a dumb excuse every time we want to have sex with someone outside of our household. 
well, cool, we're going to get really good at making dumb excuses to get around government. Like there's, it goes one of two ways. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, is there, that, that's it, right? It's kind of, kind of binary response to this one. Either you're going to keep having sex or you're not. I mean, may, or I guess, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to limit myself here. Maybe, maybe people start getting arrested for having sex. That's the new civil disobedience is having private sex at home with someone who doesn't live with you. You know, it, and yeah, I get it. A lot of sex does happen in between people who live together. That's nice for, for people who have those arrangements. But a, a lot of sex happens in circumstances that don't meet that criteria. So now you, you, we've covered food. We've covered sex. Let's get some money, shall we? I like money. You like money, Jim? Love Do you me. like money? Do you like sex? Do you like sex too? We should hang out. <laughs> <laughs> Idiocracy. Yeah. All right. From fxstreet.com, is America headed for a post-apocalyptic currency collapse? Just when it seemed as though America may be turning the corner after months of lockdown, just when it seemed as though we were on a path to reopening and gradually returning to normalcy, just when the prospects of panic-induced social unrest seemed to be behind us, America's cities erupted into flames. Antifa and BLM organized rioting, looting, violence, and mayhem have pushed cities across the country into pandemonium. Even if the insurrections are soon quelled, as President Donald Trump promised to do in a speech in front of the White House on Monday, the consequences won't soon go. By the way, I have to, I have to dispute a, a little bit of this. Cities across the country into pandemonium? Is it, is it really the right, like, compared to the, the coronavirus lockdowns, like, at some point, we're going to start seeing graphs comparing the economic impact of the virus itself, the shutdowns, and the George Floyd protests slash riots. I guarantee you, there is one of those that is going to be like a scale bigger. Option B, yeah, the, the, the lockdowns, the shutdowns, that's what's causing the, the real economic pandemonium. I mean, most people like, I mean, even in Phoenix, right, where, where like here in Arizona, 8 p.m. curfew, even in Phoenix, like I was there yesterday, 99% of things are, 99% are of people are going about their lives as normal, although as normal is now under really fucked up coronavirus lockdown conditions. That's still the backdrop of this. That's the much bigger story still. So like even, even with, when you were there, Jim, and that was the second biggest night of protests and things. It got bigger Friday, right? Yeah. And then slowed down Saturday. And now with the curfew, it's yeah, pretty much shut. I mean, it was kind of like a little protester in the day now, and then they're obeying the curfew at that point. Yeah, and and we saw there was a moment of diffusing tensions at the last protest in Phoenix a few days ago. It was during the day where they asked yeah. officers to take a knee, and a lot of them did. Yeah. And the protesters cheered and went away. And that was that was the big story here in Arizona. And it's like cops are finally like this is huge progress, by the way. Huge. Huge. That that, that riot I mean, that, that this is not gonna turn into a Kent State kind of situation. Hopefully. I mean, if it if it hasn't already, I mean in a sense it already has. We, I, like a, how can I say that? Like I just brought you the story of National Guard troops firing and on and, and, and killing somebody on our like. So it just did reach that level. So it's our yeah, but is it gonna get like that everywhere? No, no. Like is this is this, is it possible? Like and and stop and think about this from the perspective of of we the people resisting manipulation by government. Like I don't want to go to any of these. Pro like I'm happy to do a show for Blackout Tuesday, like we did a special edition this week. You know, I'm I'm happy to to cover the protests and the stories and say, well, yeah, people are pissed. They, you know, they they're they're asking for for to be heard. As MLK say, riots are the voice of the voiceless. Okay, I don't want to encourage it. It's it's, it's we are let, let's resist this manipulation. This is what they want us to do right now, right? Yeah, don't do it. And you think. It, there, there's it's the mainstream media, it's the federal government, it's all these you know big globalist corrupt interests going. Let's have blood in the streets. Let's put out bricks, 
right? We talked about that story a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah, pretty clear. There's there's a lot of uh, these are not grassroots. Let's just put it that. And that's all you need to know for the bigger narrative. Where are the bricks coming from? Who put them out? Who is it? That, why don't they have cameras on the license? You know, eh, it, it doesn't matter. It's a, uh, rabbit hole you don't need to go down. So, <clears throat> how do we not play into this? And it's like if, if the powers that be are trying to get riots and, 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 and to get protesters and, and, and cops to fight, and cops and protesters are going, eh, we're going to find a way not to fight in this situation. That's huge. That's great progress. We saw the story from Michigan where the sheriff took off his helmet and said, I'm going to march with you guys. I am I am all for this cause. Black Lives Matter. I am all for justice for George Floyd. I want murdering cops to be held accountable. He does. He realizes like enough cops now have the presence of mind to understand. Yeah, we don't want this. Yeah. If, even if we want to be corrupt assholes and get the ego boost, like we we need to be like we need to flatten these outliers of violence at least so we can maintain the general racket. That's that's a good awareness. That's better than oh, I'm a cop and I get to be the one standing in front of the murderer, protecting him from people who want to stop him, and I get to just be a part of this corrupt system. And as long as I get a nice paycheck and I don't get held accountable for abusing my power, I don't care. Well, now it's like ah, shit. We live in a connected world, and I'm gonna get judged as a cop for bad cops. Let's, or for, I should say, for for the truly truly evil cops. They're all they're all bad in terms of supporting and protecting the, the truly evil nature excuse me of the system and they're bad cops for inviting victim enforcing victimless crime laws and even if they don't as individuals for being a part of a system that promotes and makes possible the victimization of individuals with the excuse of victimless crime laws so back to the money some epi ep epidemiologists seized on the protest to predict a spike in the spread of the coronavirus due to the gathering of large crowds they claim the flattened curve could begin to steepen all over again. The experts may be wrong, as they have often been during this outbreak. The nationwide lockdowns and social distancing rules, beyond isolating the infected and protecting vulnerable populations, such as those in nursing homes, may prove to have been overkill. Yes, the cure is worse than the disease. The response to pandemic fears, including and especially the economic consequences, certainly contributed to driving some people over the edge. Pent up stress, frustration, boredom, alienation, fear, and other symptoms of cabin fever created the potential for a social confl conflagration. Lots of big words in the story. Jeremy Boring of the Daily Wire suggests that social chaos erupted in an eight-step process. One, instill fear. Two, lock people in their houses. Three, drive tens of millions out of work. Four, remove the pressure valves. Sports, concerts, bars, theaters, lunch with friends. Five, close the churches. Six, dehumanize through masking the healthy. Seven, wait. Eight, strike match. The match was the death of a suspect named George Floyd. And he had fentanyl and other drugs in his system that may have been charged with and may have been charged with a relatively minor crime. Anyway, but the establishment media decided without evidence of racial bias by the officer and in contradiction to evidence that shows black arrestees are actually less likely to be killed by white cops to make Floyd's death all about the incendiary issue of race. Time will tell if race played a role, but most agree the video evidence shows the officer in the wrong, and so the fire was lit. So, skipping ahead in this story, the demands for bailout, I'm sorry, some economists are predicting a death blow to small businesses that were already under unprecedented financial strain. If they weren't ransacked, looted, and destroyed by hooligans, they will feel the macro effects of urban decline and flight plummeting consumer confidence, falling property values, and worsening budgetary crises for state and local governments. But don't worry, Walmart, Amazon, Google, J.P. Morgan Chase, and all their close friends in Washington, D.C. will be just fine. In the event that any too-big-to-fail entity runs into trouble, it will get bailed out by the Federal Reserve. The demands for bailouts going forward will only accelerate lockdown relief is still being dispensed, and soon riot relief will come too. The currency crisis will also come perhaps later this year, perhaps further out in time. So I talked about this when we first heard 
this really scary bill coming from the federal government. And it's not scary to me to think, oh, I might get $2,000 a month. All right. For the, in, for the duration of the crisis, which is really until the system manufacturing the crisis collapses, right? So, <laughs> oh man, it's hard not to laugh. Just watch, like I and I put, like I put up a tweet today. You know, you know, you know when you studied German history in your government-sponsored textbooks in high school, and you thought to yourself. Why did the German people not see this coming and, and do something about it? Why didn't they stop it? You go, oh my God, America, there is no face palm big enough. Because some of us are trying to stop this. Some of us have been for so long. And it's like, uh, really? Really? If 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 we if we had just if we had just you know, listen to those of us who have been pointing these things out for so long. Maybe we wouldn't be at this point. Now, the bill was $2,000 a month for every unemployed American, potentially for two, uh, in a married couple in a household, plus 2000 for each of up to three dependent children. Family of five, $10,000 a month. And that's for anybody earning one hundred twenty thousand dollars or less. You, you get one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year in welfare. Now you go, you look at that, and I go, oh, ten thousand. I could live really good on a ten thousand dollars a month. Holy shit! What a life! Sign me up, and I don't have to work. I'm just, and it's nice for a while. It's nice for a while. Until everybody's walking around with $120,000 and not working. Then what? Admittedly, most of us in the sound money camp have been surprised at how resilient the Federal Reserve note has been for so long. But the world's primary reserve currency has never had to weather a storm quite like the one we are in now. No government can borrow into oblivion and no currency can be printed into oblivion without that currency losing credibility and purchasing power. If you don't own hard money, gold and silver now, what are you waiting for? In the post-apocalyptic America that we seem to be heading to where precious metals may be one of the only things you can count on. Now, of course, I would have to mention cryptocurrency as well. And I saw, by the way, in our private patron-only chat, if you want to be in the, on this, patreon.com slash Adam versus the man. And when we do our Friday shows, we're going to be giving away free access to our members only telegram chat i saw it in that chat this morning somebody asked well what if the grid fails what if electricity goes down what if the network goes down what if you really can't access cryptocurrency well for the same reason that if you take away sex if you take away internet porn you're going to have a lot of angry young men with way too much time on their hands. I don't think it's possible. Look what happened in Egypt not too long ago in the Arab Spring when they tried to shut down the internet. What did the people rise up and say? Well, <laughs> when the government shuts down the internet, it's time to shut down the government. No, too much of a imbued creature comfort. They can constrain it. They can limit it. They can throttle us. They really cannot shut down Bitcoin without shutting down the internet itself. And they won't get away with that. And if they do, you know, by the way, I do, I do advise, I do note the relative fragility of any cryptocurrency that, you know, you could lose your device, you could lose your password, you could, I mean, it's the same thing, you know, is, is physical metal, yeah, you could lose the physical metal. That's a lot harder, right? So you should have a backstop. Always, always, you know, as much as you want to invest in crypto, I would say have, have a backstop in, in ammo, in, in silver, in gold. Have something that, that, you know, is impervious to any of these shutdowns. That's the point of having diversification for economic security for yourself. Stock up on gold and silver, guns and ammunition and non-perishable foods plus household essentials while you still can. 
So if you're in a position to get these checks, it's really tempting. And by the way, file for unemployment, get your $1,200 stimulus, take all the money you can while you can. And stock out, turn it into something that's not going to lose all of its value. When the social fabric unravels, being self-reliant becomes absolutely essential. Calling 911 during an emergency may not do much good if the police, fire departments, and ambulances are overwhelmed. If you store precious metals at home rather than a secure depository, a well-concealed fireproof safe to store precious metals will protect them in the event of a home invasion. Most burglars look for obvious things to grab quickly and take off. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, the same supposed leaders in positions of power who are failing us now can be expected to continue failing. The elites who control the media and both political parties seem to be operating as if wrecking the country is their goal. Point Tucker Carlson powerfully drove home on his Fox News show Monday. It's time to get prepared, both personally and financially, if you're not already. So back to the hour.com. At the same time, the French government was grappling with bankruptcy, a legacy of its 18th century wars, including its assistance to the American revolutionaries. The dire state of French finances was made public in 1786 when the last of the wartime taxes expired, and it became clear the government was running a serious deficit. The controller general tried to impose reforms to solve the fiscal crisis, including a broad-based tax but was met with stiff resistance. The decision to call the Estates General to bring about financial and political reform, including a new constitution for the country, provided the catalyst for social unrest and violence, including the storming of the Bastille and the Great Fear, a series of peasant riots fueled by panic and conspiracy theories that spread across the French countryside in the summer of 1789. The grim situation that the French faced in 1788 was made even worse by the fact that those suffering knew that life could be better. Why? Because they had a glimpse into a better future. The popularization of Enlightenment literature that critiqued inequalities in the social and political system, along with the polar politicization of the French citizenry that had accompanied elections of the Estates General, convinced many French men and women that political representation in a more just polity could bring about genuine change. Do you see the parallels today? <clears throat> Despite all of the upheaval and the doom and gloom and the fi financial manipulation that is now obvious to every American, you see it. I mean, I, you just sum it up. The rich get richer, the poor get poor. It's just one of those things designed to do that. The technology advances keep coming. Sex robots. The little robot dogs, pack animals that the military has. The technology that we see police using against the American people. Robot servants, 3D printers. All of the luxuries enjoyed by the super class who are at the cutting edge of these technologies, who, who have the money, they buy whatever they want. They still get that. And the rest of us don't. There's going to be a kind of technocracy, if you will, and people who have access to the luxuries of modern technology and those who don't. And a big part of that's medical care. Have you tried to go to a hospital lately? It sucks. It doesn't for the elites. If you're a member of Congress, if you're a senator, if you're part of the Trump administration, you get to go to the front of the line. You don't have to worry about insurance or paying for stuff or not having the latest technology or medicine or the adequate time from doctors. No. Whereas the rest of us, Worry about these things, regardless of how well off you are in, in upper middle class America, even. Is your insurance going to cover this or are you going to be bankrupted by a health crisis? Or right now, are you even going to be able to get to a hospital? Are you going to be seen? Hospitals are shutting down. Not shutting down hospitals entirely, but wards, departments. 
because of the corona corona phobia crisis because of the forced unemployment crisis because non-essential procedures have to be pushed back the fuller picture conforms to the late sociologist james chowning davies theory of political revolutions which suggests that revolutions are a response to a downturn in the economy after a significant period of growth that allows individuals to envision a more promising future. A population subjected to unmitigated poverty and oppression cannot imagine a better alternative and consequently is unlikely to revolt. However, as life begins to improve and a happier life is conceivable, a sudden reversal of fortune can seem unbearable and trigger revolutionary activity. This theory offers one way of thinking about the outbreak of revolution in France in 1789. The economic crisis of the years 87, 88 created new and insufferable hardship throughout the country, while a changing political culture informed by enlightenment philosophy convinced many people that a more capable government could alleviate the hardship of its citizens, rising expectations dashed by economic downturn and royal incompetence meant that the people of France were ready to take to the streets. This theory may be playing out again Today, the gains of the civil rights movement made it possible to imagine that a future of racial equality was within reach. And when Barack Obama became president, it represented to many a powerful symbol of progress. But enduring inequality and police violence and a highly visible white backlash that emerged in response to Obama's election have been crushing. The COVID-19 pandemic and the collapse of the economy have thrown into prominence the sharp disparities in this country and exacerbated the stress and anguish of those suddenly facing economic catastrophe. These dashed expectations of a better life made recent incidents of police brutality, assertion of white privilege and other acts of racial violence all the more intolerable. It is not surprising that the murder of George Floyd was the match that lit the fuse. However, this entire model misses the fact that what we are on the verge of is not a revolution, but a parabolic increase in quality of life, at least in our potential for humanity. These curves of how much we have produced and how much more we could without government, the disparity, the gap, the potential gap of government, you might look back and say, well, over history, there have been revolutions. There have been times when things got crazy, things got bad, and then they got worse on our way up in our climb up this parabolic arc. There have been spikes. It has not all been a consistent, beautiful curve of human progress, but still you zoom out and you find that the decrease in violence, as Steven Pinker has demonstrated, follows a similar curve over time, yes, with some spikes for the world wars and things like that. But all of the little blips over the course of human progress, the revolutions, suggest a bigger curve as well. What we are on the verge of is not so much a revolution, but a period never ending of unprecedented evolution. And that is a far beautiful thing, far more beautiful thing to celebrate than any revolution ever could be.